Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Office hours. Uh, as always, we're going to uh, give a few minutes to let everyone kind of shuffle in here. So we'll uh, officially get started. Um, let's call it uh, 12.03. Okay. All right, just one more minute and we'll get going here. Please feel free to fire away with any questions. Obviously, this is the venue for, um, for you to, to post any questions. Happy to address whether you are a uh, parent of a, a senior who's kind of uh, approaching the finish line here, or if you are a you know, parent of a junior, underclassman, uh, fire away. Um, you know, I, I think today we'll, we'll keep it somewhat brief. Um, we're in, uh, at least for the class of uh, 2021, uh, we're, we're in a bit of a holding pattern, I'd say. Um, you know, we, we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, but obviously we got sort of decision day behind us, May 1st. Um, you know, so housing deposits are in. Um, and, and so, we know what the uh, the school choice is. Uh, we know what sort of the bottom line is going to be in terms of you know the financial aid package, the net cost uh, for that particular school. Um, but now we're waiting on the actual bill from the college, right? So we're not going to get that bill, and, and you know it's going to be dependent on the school. But typically, that bill is going to uh, be sent to you uh, end of this month or beginning of June. Uh, with a, a due date of typically August 1st, could be August 15th. Again, it's depending on the institution. Um, and again, you're, you're going to get a bill for the first semester, right? You're going to be billed per semester. You're not billed for the year. So the, the bill that comes out um, this, this, uh, this June or in the next couple of weeks is going to reflect kind of the first semester costs less the first semester financial aid that was given. Um, and so, for example, um, you know, if, if, you were, uh, if you were offered a $20,000 need-based grant, um, you know, 10,000 of that will be, uh, you know, for the first semester, um, the other 10 uh, for the second semester. Um, you know, same thing with, with regard to say the federal direct student loan, and we'll spend some time talking about some of the borrowing options. But the federal direct student loan for every freshman, as most of us know, it's 5,500 bucks. So 2750, half of that will be dispersed for the first bill uh, for the first semester. And then the second will be dispersed for the, uh, the second part of the bill uh, for the second semester. So we're kind of waiting on, and, and, and that's when we know, that's when we'll know kind of down to the dollar what the out-of-pocket expense is gonna be. Um, you know, the, the colleges actually right now are still figuring out for the most part exactly what the, the costs are going to be, um, you know, the, the, uh, whether you use the cap projections or whether the, the college offered it in the financial aid award that they sent, um, the exact dollar amount uh, really isn't determined until you actually get that bill. It's going to look very close, but down to the dollars when you'll know when you get that bill. Okay, so um, you know, we're in a holding pattern there, uh, with regard to, you know, getting the bill, uh, and then, you know, expectations wise is, you know, let's say we get that bill at the beginning of June and we have that, the, 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 there's a funding gap and, and, you know, that bill needs to be paid, um, August 1st, you know, what we want to do at, at this point in the process is start to, you know, think about the resources that we have available, uh, on the table, and hopefully, you know, you've been able to to leverage College Aid Pro and, and sort of the pre-approval exercise. Where um, even if you did it several months ago, it's a good exercise to to go through now as we're kind of approaching paying that bill. 
revisiting that, you know, seeing what's, what's the most current balance in the 529, you know, are you still contributing to that, you know, really taking a hard look at cash flow, um, you know, what can you on a monthly basis from income, not from other, you know, assets, but from income, can you um, contribute on a monthly basis, you know, look at, you know, non-retirement, cash, checking, savings, or investments and saying, okay, well, you know, what can we do comfortably from those resources on a year to year basis and, you know, start to come up with sort of how you're going to be paying the bill. And the, the concept being, you know, we want to limit borrowing or push it off for as long as possible, even if that means we're pushing it off for a semester or for a year. Um, you know, we're paying points on, on those loans. Um, so we want to be mindful of kind of pushing that off um, for as long as we can. So really, it, it, hopefully everyone is, has been able to start to do that. But, um, you know, understanding uh, even before having the actual bill. Um, and, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of go into to cap here, which might help facilitate the, the conversation. Just give me one minute. I'll show my screen. Um, and, you know, I want to start talking some, some high level concepts with borrowing, right? Um, if there is a funding gap, how you're going to finance that and some of those things, we're going to do a very detailed presentation on the borrowing, uh, really, uh, options out there. The reason why we're not doing that now is because, we don't have the rates and the terms disclosed yet from the federal government, the state organizations, right? So those are going to be two of the uh, main places for us to actually go and, and look and evaluate, you know, what's the Fed offering? What are the states offering? And then, you know, you have the private sector as well. So we're going to talk about that in sort of broad strokes. Um, and then eventually, once everything is disclosed, we're going to talk Um in detail, right? Lay out all the pros and cons and, and depending on your family, depending on your situation and what speaks to you, that's really is what will dictate, um, you know, which borrowing option might be uh, um, best for you. Um, but again, we, we've gone through this before, uh, but I think it's always good to re revisit it. Um, and in terms of starting to really think about how we're going to pay for this bill um, and it, with the mindset of trying to limit that borrowing as much as we can. Okay, so uh, bear with me here as I uh, share my screen. Um, everyone can see my screen. Just throw, uh, uh, throw something in the chat there for me. Um, let me know. You could see the screen. You could hear me okay. Uh, running solo today, so I don't have Matt. He's not going to be joining us um, today, so I don't have him as a spot. So that would be helpful if you could throw that in the chat. Make sure you hear me okay. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, okay. So, you know, again, you know, revisiting the pre approval kind of page here, I think, is a helpful exercise. And this is just sort of a dummy case here, but um, you know, this is where usually we like to start with clients, right? Let's start here at the beginning of this process. And if you are an underclassman parent, this is going to be a good review for you as well. You know, let's get realistic on what we actually can afford for college, um, you know, for this particular student, right? And now revisiting this exercise as we're actually getting ready to approach the bill. So getting, you know, getting very clear on, you know, what is the balance as of today? You know, are we still contributing? Maybe we're doing that and we're only about three months away. So kind of getting uh, refined here, you know, maybe six or eight months ago, you said we could do $5,000 a year from our, you know, non-retirement investments. But as we're kind of getting close here, you know, revisit that number, maybe, Maybe you can uh, stretch that to seven. Maybe it's ten thousand a year. So that's forty thousand if we do if we're able to do that each of the four years. And then really taking a look at cash flow, right? So cash flow is you have your monthly income, you have your expenses. Is there a surplus? If that's the case, you know what of that surplus can you dedicate towards paying for college? Um, 
or the other exercise that's really good to, to go through here is, you know, can you take a look at some expenses that you have now while your son or daughter is living with you in the house? And will those, uh, you know, kind of monthly expenses um, go away once they actually are not living in your house? And, you know, a, a lot of times we talk about, you know, it, it, your son or daughter, they're going to be, you know, living at college, they're going to, you know, uh, they're going to have their meal plan there. So, you know, will you be saving some money on your grocery bills? Um, they're not going to be eating at home, um, you know, it, and, and usually the general statistic is, you know, it's about 250 bucks for the student to eat for the month at college. So if you want to translate that, that to your own home, you know, it's a bit of a stretch maybe, but technically speaking, they, it's $250 that, you know, uh, will, will, that, that you don't have to feed your student at home, right? Obviously they're gonna be off and, and you're paying college bill, but these are the types of things to start thinking about. Are there any clubs or memberships or sports that you're currently paying for that maybe you know the, that's gonna be done with once they go to school? So re-examining that cash flow and, and again, cash flow is coming out of income, right? The, the income coming in, money going out, what's left over, and then can we redirect anything? So. Um, taking a hard look there because it does start to add up over the course of four years, right? If we can kind of raise this up $300 a month, that's $15,000 roughly. And really where that's impactful is if that's $15,000, we would have had to borrow at, you know, five, six, 7% compounding, right? That, that translates into, you know, quite a bit of savings when you look at it in the long term. Um, I'll quickly talk on the uh, American Opportunity Tax Credit, right? So this automatically gets calculated based on your AGI. The system will do that. This particular case uh, doesn't qualify for it. But um, if your AGI is $160,000 or below, you, you get the max federal credit. It's $2,500 per year. Um, so you'll get, you know, that's part of your, you, when you file your taxes and you know, what we try to coach is if that's the case, listen, that 2,500 bucks, don't use that to do home improvements or go on vacation. Take that 2,500 bucks, put it towards the college bill, because if you do get the max, that's 10 grand over the course of the four years. Uh, and again, if the alternative is borrowing, that can, you know, be quite the, you know, a savings. Uh, revisiting the student's assets. So if there's any UGMA money, UTMA money, um, you know, uh, is there any, you know, uh, any amount of money that they're going to be um, contributing? And then same thing for, you know, their monthly cash flows. You know, some students will work, will contribute towards the bill, depending on, you know, most won't, right? So most kids don't have assets and won't be working, but there are cases where that you know the student will participate, and again, even if it's they have a part-time job or what have you, and they want to contribute two hundred bucks a month, you know it's almost ten thousand bucks. And again, if the alternative is is borrowing, um, uh, that th there's compounded savings there. And then this is the the opportunity if you know there's grandparent help or other relative help, and if you know that has kind of come up in general terms. Now, this is kind of the time where we want to get some details around there. You could sort of facilitate that conversation. Hey, we're putting together our college funding plan. You mentioned you maybe want to help. Can we get some clarity on how, you know, what that's going to look like? So, um, you know, maybe it's 10,000 bucks over the course of the four years. So just refining the process in terms of what, what the pre-approval pre number is as you're at the finish line. And then, you know, going into the how to pay page is is where you know if you haven't done it thus far this is where i would kind of point you to and, and um let's go ahead and we'll put in a uh a mock award here so we're working with actuals um there we go so again, some financial aid awards will have the costs on there. If, if they don't, you could use the default cost. Now, here's something I want to speak about. You know, in the cost of attendance, right, the colleges will include things like travel and miscellaneous. They'll even include books. The reason why they do that is because that allows them to 
um, gauge the maximum amount that somebody can borrow. So they want that that borrowing eligibility to it, to include those types of expenses. But you're not going to be billed for these things. And you know, I, you know, I went to Stonehill College, and my my parents didn't spend sixteen hundred dollars on you know travel costs. So you're actually, if you want to drill down to what your actual billable costs are going to be, you're gonna you know you're gonna have to pay for books and things like that. So if you do want to include that as part of your plan, you certainly can. Um, but if you wanted to back those sort of things out and just kind of work with the direct costs, you can do that as well. So let's just say, for example, we got a $20,000 merit scholarship here. Um, we were offered, uh, let's just say we were offered the 5,500 bucks in the unsubsidized loan. And we're going to, we're going to accept the, uh, we're going to accept that, that uh, unsubsidized loan, the federal direct student loan, because we're going to have to borrow at some point in the process here. So we want to, uh, if that's the case, if you're a family that's going to uh, have to borrow in some capacity, whether it's freshman year or senior year, typically you want to start by maximizing that federal loan program, um, uh, the federal direct student loan program. Um, that's that's going to be your best way to start borrowing. So let me let me take a minute here, uh, and and we got some questions that have come in. Uh, Mission in getting the subsidized portion of the federal student loan and doing that each year to build credit in my daughter's name, then paying the entire loan off of the 529 monies within six months after she graduates. Using that strategy, what is the process of applying for just the subsidized portion? All right, so really good question. So I read that quickly. Um, this particular uh, family, they, they want to only access the subsidized portion of the federal direct student loan. Right. So if your family demonstrated need, part of that 5,500 federal direct student loan is going to be offered in a subsidized portion. Typical breakdown is 3,500 is subsidized, 2,000 is unsubsidized. So you have the opportunity to only accept the subsidized portion of that loan. Um, you can indicate that on the uh, sometimes on the uh, award itself, where the college will ask, you know, what. Are you going to accept? What are you going to decline? And then I, I discussed this a couple of weeks ago, but in order to actually execute on the federal direct student loan, the student has to do what's called entrance counseling and sign a master promissory note. OK, so on on that during that process, you'll have the ability to indicate what you are accepting. And then, you know, to kind of go the, the, the full measure is you'll want to contact the financial aid office and just let them know, hey, we're only looking to access the subsidized portion of that, okay? And in this case, the strategy is we want to take the subsidized portion because it's 0% interest, right? There's no interest that's accruing on that loan. Take that each year. We're going to decline the unsubsidized because the unsubsidized, the interest is accruing, and then pay that off, um, you know, six within six months after graduation when the first bill is due. So, um, and again, because the federal direct student loan is an agreement between the, the student and the federal government, um, you know, it's in their name that will establish credit. So um, that would be a good exercise. Also under the assumption that, you know, there's enough resources between the 529 and, and other parent resources where, you know, borrowing is not going to be required. Um, so that was a, a good question there. How do you get the, okay, so I'm showing my screen here. And the question is, how do you get the menu to appear on the left hand side? I don't see that on, on my screen. The, the reason why there's a different view, because this is the advisor side of the tool. The advisor side of the tool has a different look and feel than the uh, parent side. So maybe I'll, I'll log in as the parent side. So all the functionality is the same, except for, you know, advisors who license this tool have a little bit of a different look and feel. Uh, let's see here. So question on, you know, trying to decide if I use the 529 money first, there's about one year's worth of money in that account. We have another year in our savings account. What do we use first? So 
you know, that's a good question. I'm going to go through that live here um, uh, on this how to pay page. So you could kind of run some of your own exercises, which I'll do now. So, um, you know, this is really talking to strategy on deploying funds in the most efficient way. And so, so we'll go through that exercise now. So Stonehill College, um, here's the net costs, right? So, and actually it, it, a good reminder here is, you know, there's projected and there's awards. So at this point, ideally for, you know, you seniors, you've put the award information uh, on the awards page, right? Because that will translate over and give you the ability to start working with actual information, right? So now we're, we're not working with projected uh, numbers. We have actual financial aid awards, so we can start working with actual awards. So all of that will push over. So we put that, I got a 20, my student got a $20,000 scholarship. Uh, typically those are good for all four years. Um, so you'll see that's pushed across the board here because we want to kind of plan this thing out on the four-year level. So we're looking at a net cost of 172, 173. Based on the pre-approval exercise that we just kind of went through roughly, um, we have total resources of 124. That leaves us with a funding gap of around 50,000, right? So how do we start filling that gap? Well, you know, if, if there's a gap and we can't come up with any more resources via pre-approval, we got to start thinking about how we fill that gap with borrowing. So we want to start by, you know, using the federal student loan, um, which maxes out at 27,000 bucks over the course of the four years. So now we still have a remaining funding gap of 21,000. Okay. So that's when we have to start thinking about borrowing up above and beyond that 27 K in the federal direct student loan, but circling back to the, um, uh, the question about, you know, using 529s, do we front load it? Do we hang on to it? Things like that. So this is when you can start to play with different scenarios, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, we can just start playing with this here. So um, let's see. So right now we have a funding gap of, you know, the 9,000. So call it 10,000 in a funding gap, assuming that, you know, we have the 2,500 bucks from the grandparents, the students, going to, and I'm going to zero that out just to be a little bit more realistic. So, you know, when we zero that out, we're looking at, uh, you know, a little over 12,000. We know borrowing is going to have to happen at some point, right? So we want to maximize this loan. And remember, this is a use it or lose it program. So to get the 27,000 bucks, you know, you have to use it each year. Um, so we're still short about 7,000 bucks. So in this case, likely what I would probably want to do is um, we want to use that 529 to kind of front load this, right? So we'd probably back this down 7,000. So yeah, let's just change this to five. We'll add another seven on here. Okay. So now, now we're, we're kind of zeroing out, right? So this is kind of what we want to do. And again, um, in this particular case, you know, I've kind of decided I'm going to, you know, maximize this loan program at 27 grand. And, you know, what we say is like, listen, if you could get through undergrad with no borrowing at all, that's the ideal situation. The next best situation is limiting any borrowing to the 27,000 in the federal direct student loan. That's still a home run. That's a great outcome. Um, so, you know, in this particular case, I'm assuming we're going to do that and we're going to try to limit it uh, to that number if possible. So that's what we want to do. So we would take that that 529 kind of front load it there, um, you know, um, so that way we're, we're just keeping the borrowing for freshman year to the 5,500 bucks. We know we don't have to borrow anything on top of that. So then we could start to say, OK, well, let's start taking a look at year two here. Um, you know, we have a funding gap of 14,000. Uh, we're going to take the 6,500. So we're going to need, you know, roughly around 8,000 bucks to kind of fill this gap. So that way we can limit the borrowing to the 6,500. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let's zero this out. We'll take another six out of here. 
we'll add this, uh, we'll add about six here. And just, I'm gonna use rough numbers here to get us moving along here. Um, so we're start, starting to work that number down. Okay, another, we need another 4,000. So let's, let's add the 4,000 here. Okay, so we're zeroed out here. We know that we got the bill paid for year one, year two. We're limiting the borrow to the federal direct student loan. We don't have to borrow, you know, as a parent beyond that. Um, and now we're kind of, we're pushing, uh, pushing that down to uh, years three and years four. Um, so that's kind of the general concept here. And obviously if, if you know, you can do the same thing here for the, uh, you know, the parent's assets, depending on how you value that, right? So if, if you're a family that says, okay, yep, we're gonna do 40,000 for the four years and we have that in a lump sum to start, then you could kind of do a similar concept here. But if you're a family that says, we're just gonna do 10,000 a year, it's a little, a little bit more challenging to start to you know, play with how you disperse that money if it's only gonna be a set number per year. But with the 529s, that's kind of a general concept that you want to go ahead and use to start to, if borrowing is the alternative, start to front load that a little bit. So you could use this page to really start drilling down on being strategic with deploying that. Um, I would say if, if there's any UTMA money or UGMA money um, that is going to be used for college, those are typically going to be the first monies to use. So front loading that as well. And again, the high level concept is, uh, you know, minimizing that borrowing and pushing it off for as long as possible. Uh, it's going to be your best bet. Let's see here. Yeah, so, so another question with regard to circling back to, you know, taking that subsidized loan and just paying that off uh, right after college. Um, the subsidized portion of that is the interest rate portion. And um, you can uh, elect to only take the interest-free subsidized portion of that. You'll just have to make sure you communicate that with the financial aid office and let them know that's your intention. Um, issue with a password. Um, yep, so let's... Let's connect. Um, we won't use this venue to address a password issue. Um, you can send me an email. Um, you, know, you could send me an email directly and we'll troubleshoot that. All right. Um, And I guess we're staying on that, uh, taking that student loan and then paying it off. So you could do that, that strategy with the unsubsidized portion as well. Um, it's less advisable um, because the interest is accruing on that money upon disbursement. You know, so if you have 529 money that would, uh, would cover that, you know, you might want to just take that interest-free portion. Um, however, if your main concern is, you know, establishing and building credit, you certainly still could do that, but just know the interest on the unsubsidized is accruing during the, the, the college year. So you're going to be paying points on that money. So the other thing too, is if, if your 529 money is for some reason, um, you know, um, getting returns higher than the rate of the, the unsubsidized loan, which is around 3%. So if you're getting higher returns, technically you can, you can beat that as well, but um, you could do it both the unsubsidized and subsidized portion of that. So a question about, and this is a good segue into talking about, um, you know, even in this example here, the, the latter years where, okay, we've been able to kind of get through years one, two, part of year three, um, but we're going to have, you know, loan gaps or funding gaps here um, where we're going to have to borrow on top of the, the federal student loans. You know, what are kind of the options? So, so starting to talk through some of the, uh, the borrowing options available. Um, so, 
with regard to the, the interest rates for the unsubsidized federal loan, those are not, uh, like I said, the, the loan programs for next school year, believe it or not, they're not uh, fully disclosed just yet at the federal state level. Um, but last year's rate was for the unsubsidized federal loan was around 3%. And, you know, we'll, we'll be sending information out this, but you could go to uh, the Department of Education website. If you just Google, you know, federal direct student loan rates, you'll see last year's rates. Uh, I believe they're going to be up around 1%. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised when they're fully disclosed. It's closer to 4%. Um, and the, the Parent PLUS loan, which is the Federal Parent Borrowing Program, which I believe last year the rate was in and around 5%, it's likely up a uh, point. So um, it's going to be around 6% uh, for the Parent PLUS loan. So, you know, talking about borrowing on top of the federal direct student loan, um, you know, there, there's essentially, there's, there's three main uh, avenues, right? So it's the federal government, with the state organizations or the private sector. So starting with the public, uh, I'm sorry, the federal government, uh, so long as the FAFSA was submitted, uh, the parent is able to borrow through that program, which is called the Parent PLUS loan. Um, some of the high level pros and cons there, um, uh, from a pro standpoint, it's a very easy application, probably takes 15 minutes online. Uh, it's a very quick, um, you know, they, they run a, a instant credit check. And so long as, as they say, you don't have adverse credit, um, you're likely to get approval. So from a, a credit worthiness standpoint, the Parent PLUS loan is the most lenient. Um, so usually if you're a family where your credit score is a bit of a concern, um, many times that uh, probably becomes the best option. Okay. Um, so, so, that's certainly in the pro column, I'd say. Um, you can select a full deferment on payments um, at no additional cost, uh, right? So, so you can, you're not obligated to make any payments while the student's in school and until six months thereafter. However, the interest is accruing the entire time. Um, and it's a fixed rate as well, right? So it's going to be between, somewhere around 6% this year. Um, and that's a fixed rate, whether you start making payments on that money, whether you choose to defer, it, it's going to remain the same. Um, so, so, um, you know, I'm a fan of fixed rates, you know, you're getting involved in. So that's a pro the rate isn't necessarily great, right? It's around 6%. Um, and there is an origination fee that's baked into, uh, it's about 4% origination fee that is baked into the, um, you know, the life of the loan. So, um, you know, if you really want to get detailed, it's, it, it adds a, a significant cost to the borrowing. Um, it's just uh, sort of baked into the life of the loan. Um, so certainly we put that in the, um, the cons of the Parent PLUS loan. Um, what, what many families will do, and it's for kind of flexibility and peace of mind is, you know, you have the ability to borrow up to the amount that it costs to go to college per year, right? And these loans are a year by year thing. Um, and they actually a lot, like I said, they a lot for even a, a couple thousand dollars in addition to cover things like travel and books and things like that. So some families, you know, to have the peace of mind, they'll, they'll choose to borrow the full amount, right? Let's just say there's a $40,000 delta between the net cost um, between the cost of attendance and, you know, the financial aid uh, that was offered. So there, there's this $40,000 gap and, you know, some families will say, listen, 40,000 bucks this year is completely unrealistic. We don't have the resources or, or what have you. So, but they want peace of mind knowing that, okay, the student can register, they can attend school, all the bills are going to be paid. So they'll borrow the full amount, select deferment, and that's completely fine as long as you know what you're getting involved in. But usually what I say to that, if you choose that route, yes, maybe $40,000, I mean, for most, $40,000 expense is unrealistic, but 
come up with a number that you do feel comfortable with paying for that year, even if it's $5,000, $10,000, because there's no prepayment penalties on these loans. So what that allows you to do is start to chip away, keeps that interest from snowballing and compounding and also allows you to chip away at the principal during the college years. Um, so it helped minimize kind of that impact for um, over the course of the year. So, so that's the, the, the plus loan program. The other part of the plus loan program that, you know, is uh, definitely in the pro column is kind of their consumer protections. And by that, I mean, they have uh, certain repayment programs where uh, they're, they're called income-based repayment programs where, um, you know, if you uh, for some reason lost a job or your income is dramatically decreased, or if you just have a, you know, you're, you're a low-income family, um, the monthly payments will be structured based on your income and not necessarily what it would normally would be for a you know, 10 or 25 year loan repayment. It's structured based on your income. Uh, and that's, that's unique to the federal government. Um, so they have those sort of programs. And, and then there's also some uh, public loan forgiveness uh, programs. So uh, hard to see onto the future, but th there's forgiveness programs if you know, um, the, your student is, is considering going into certain areas in the public, uh, in the public sector, um, first responders, nurses, teachers, things like that. So um, that's part of the PLUS loan program. So the state organizations, again, they haven't disclosed uh, their rates or terms yet. We foresee that happening in the next couple of weeks, but um, not every state has a loan program. New Jersey has one. So if you're a New Jersey resident, uh, whether your student is going to school in New Jersey or out of state, you're eligible to borrow through it. Other states have programs as well. So let's say you're a new, uh, let's say you're a New York family, New York resident, uh, but your son or daughter is going to school up in Massachusetts. Well, because they're going to school in Massachusetts, they can borrow through MIFA, which is their state loan organization. Um, not every state has uh, a loan program, so New York State doesn't, uh, but there are plenty of states that do. So our advice is, listen, borrowing is a last resort. Um, you want to make sure you're shopping around and doing the, the, you know, what's best for you. And the state organizations, um, New Jersey in particular, they offer three payment options, whether you're, you start paying immediately on that principal and interest. And if you do that, you're going to be re rewarded with a lower rate. You know, the downside is now you're obligated to make these monthly payments. But I think last year, the rate was closer to like 4%. Um, so, you know, that, that, that beats the parent plus loan, um, by quite a bit, you can start making interest only payments. Um, and in that the, the rate's not going to be as good, but, um, um, you know, slightly higher, still a little bit ahead of the plus loan. And then, uh, you can elect for a full deferment. Um, and then, you know, th there's an added cost there. So the rate's a little bit higher, usually in and about a plus loan, maybe sometimes even. A little bit higher. So depending on your level of comfort, um, you know, if, if you are a family that's comfortable starting to make immediate payments, uh, going the state route, uh, you know, might be might be an effective cost, a uh, cost effective option, um, if, if you're comfortable with that. So um, and then finally, it's the private sector, right? And the private sector are the Wells Fargo's, Sally Mays, you know, citizens, of the world, there's hundreds of different options. And, you know, we caution the private sector if uh, a family's credit score is not particularly great. Um, because with the private sector, you know, your the rate that they will give you is going to hinge based off of your, your credit worthiness, right? Your credit score for the most part. And um, so if you have excellent credit, you know, close to 800 in the 800s, you're probably going to be pleasantly surprised at, at kind of the, the rate that they'll offer, especially as compared to, you know, these other programs. Um, so in that case, you know, we might encourage you to, you know, see what kind of rate you would get from a Sally May or, you know, a Wells Fargo, what have you. If your credit score is not great, you know, you, they're, they, they, there's a chance they still will approve you, uh, but they're, they're, 
they're going to penalize you with the rate. So it could be as high as 11, 12%. Um, so uh, just some of these things to be aware of as, as you kind of shop around to, to fill and finance this, you want to do this in the most cost effective way. And again, we're going to be sending out information, whether it's at the federal level state, and we'll even give you resources on how to kind of shop that private sector, um, you know, and, and do so. Um, so uh, do so effectively. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the high level around kind of that borrowing. But, you know, the long and short of it is we want to do our very best to, you know, take a hard look at the resources in front of us. Um, you know, can we dial those up? Can we push borrowing off? Um, you know, can we limit the borrowing to the 27,000? Um, and if not, you know, let's shop for, let's shop for, um, you know, the student loan in, in a strategic way. Um, so, you know, if you pick up the phone and you call the financial aid office, they're going to, uh, they're just going to tell you, go take a plus loan. And maybe for your family, that is the right option. But I think it's just a little irresponsible that they only direct you to one place where um, it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big milestone. Um, so you should kind of, uh, you know, choose the best option and, and know all your options. Okay. Okay. So we'll, uh, I'll take a breath here. Um, give you guys and gals the opportunity to throw any more questions in, in the Q and A. But yeah, so I'll, I encourage you to spend some time on this, this page, you know, make sure your actual award is in there. Um, so that way you could start working with what, what kind of the actual numbers are going to be. Um, and then you could actually start to leverage some of the actual reports. You're not going to see all the same reports. Maybe I'll just jump into the, oh. Okay, so this is kind of the family portal. This is what you see. So this is where you would put your awards in on this page. Uh, you have the ability to kind of go in here and uh, work with the how to pay. Um, and then you could start leveraging some of the uh, reports. Now, uh, kind of something new that was added recently here is this outcomes piece of the puzzle. So uh, this outcomes report, I think, is... Um, can be useful. It, it shows you what the funding gap is per school, what the starting first year salary uh, for that given uh, discipline. In this case, we're undecided, but, uh, and then it gives you the idea of some monthly take home. But then you could, you know, you could uh, print out your report from the how to pay award, start working with these actual numbers. Um, so, um, Okay, question, where do we slot private scholarships in the first year only? Okay, so good question, private scholarships. I'm glad, glad you brought that up. So private scholarships. Let's see here, do, 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 do. I know we have, here you go. So you could put that in the, the net cost drop down. So we have a, a spot for private scholarships. So you can go ahead and add that and it'll calculate there. So that will 
that's where you could put that. And then uh, it's another good point about um, private scholarships. So we've, it's fairly new. We've talked about it, but it's been a, a couple of weeks now is that uh, we've built out a private scholarship search engine. So this is all particular to your specific login here. So in this holding pattern of sorts, you know, you as a parent, really the student, you know, can spend time looking for private money. So you can leverage this search engine. Um, you know, you can search by uh, residence, you could search by uh, the institution or what you're going to study or ethnic ethnicity. Um, and so you can kind of leverage this and, you know, private scholarships require some, some work. Obviously you have to, you know, uh, take a look and see if it's something that your son or daughter is going to be eligible for. You could jump out to the URL. You could jump right into the application. You could save it for later if you want to, okay, this looks good. I'm going to uh, favorite this and come back, but you could start to spend time here capturing some of the, um, some of the private money out there, um, you know, if you, and if you, you can capture, um, you know, a couple thousand dollars through these private scholarships, again, that's going to be super helpful, especially if the alternative is borrowing. So I'm um, glad private scholarships came up. Um, again, a little bit of legwork for the, you know, typically the student, there's an application, sometimes an essay, sometimes an application. Um, but um, th there is money out there in the private sector. And, you know, this database has over 5,000 scholarships in the private sector. Um, so definitely get in there and, and um, you know, uh, leverage this tool and, um, you know, hopefully you get additional free money um, um, on top of where things are at. Okay, so we address the private scholarships where you would slot that in. Let's see here. A uh, little uh, just um, helpful tip here from uh, one of our, our uh, members here that um, maybe consider if, if you're buying a laptop, um, purchasing that sooner rather than later. Heard some things about microchip shortages. Um, so um, I can't speak to that, but uh, if there's any truth to that, um, you know, probably uh, purchasing a laptop sooner rather than later would be some good advice. So thank you for that share. Right. Um, yeah, so again, just as kind of a harvest here, um, make sure all of your awards are, are in in here. Um, and, and that's obviously going to be helpful for, for everyone, but also all the awards that are able to put, uh, that are put in here, it actually helps our system as well. So having actual financial aid awards actually helps our, uh, algorithm. Um, so, um, if you haven't added your awards there, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and then, you know, starting to work with your how to pay page, start to develop that college funding plan. Um, you know, uh, we'll be we'll be sending out more information with regard to those borrowing options, but then spending time, um, you know, really, I would probably encourage the student to spend time, but parents can certainly do this as well. Leveraging the private scholarship search, um, you know, the, the bigger net you throw there, the better your odds are. Um, so that that is that. So moving forward, um, hopefully by the next time we have uh, our office hours here, we will have the specifics on the, the Fed, the state borrowing options. Uh, and that way we could start to really uh, speak to the pros and cons of each. So it'll be somewhat of a revisit of this conversation, just drilled down a little bit further. Um, and from the looks of it, you know, most of you are, um, you know, uh, class of 2021. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, likely be speaking more to that class. But if there are any underclassmen here, please, uh, uh, we're happy to address, you know, where you're at in the process in terms of creating your budget and starting to shop uh, uh, strategically.
All right, we got a few minutes left, so I'll take a break, a uh, breather here. Um, and give you a couple of minutes if there are any, any other thoughts or questions or comments that float up, and um, and then we'll we'll wrap her up. Actually, and I'm, I'll throw this out there. Just curious, um, you know, if if any of you have um, been contacted by any schools after May 1st, um, you know, we're, we're trying to put feelers out there on, on that process. This is the first year where colleges can make offers to students uh, after the May 1st deadline. So I'd be curious if, uh, if anyone has had that experience. Uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, NGIT, begging our daughter to apply. That's always a, it's always a nice feeling. Some other, okay, all right, yeah, so appreciate you sharing that. So, yeah, there, there's some schools um, who are still, still recruiting, so to speak. So, um, I think just from a general standpoint, that's always good for the, uh, the consumer. All right, team, I'm going to give it a, a going once, going twice, going three, and then we can kind of wrap this up a few, a few minutes ahead of schedule. All right, everyone. Um, if there's nothing else that, that jumps in here, just want to thank everyone for um, attending today. Thank you for the questions. Uh, not only are they very good questions, it, uh, it makes my job easier. Um, and, and that's what this is meant for is to kind of answer your specific questions and not just listen to my talking head for an hour. Um, so grateful for you. Any questions in between now and the next office hours, you know, um, log into your, your member account, uh, leverage that community feature and, and uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, there uh, in short order. All right, everyone, we're going to wrap it up. Appreciate you. Uh, have a good rest of the week and we'll see you soon.